<clears throat> we are so thankful that you, Father, have provided the Lord, who is our salvation. And we ask now that for your glory and your honor, that you would speak so that we may hear from you and know that the voice of God has been among us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, this morning is actually uh, a continuation, as I've mentioned, of this particular prayer, but it's also a continuation of the message outline from last week. So you're going to see that some of the things that will pop up in review briefly will be identical to things that were presented last week. So as Paul continues or actually concludes this prayer that he is recording for the church at Philippi, he is, has been considering and then communicating his great appreciation for the Philippian church. And, and he, he sees how far they have come as a church in taking up their purpose under God, the purpose for which God established them, the purpose for which God called them into existence, the purpose for which God sent them into the world. They have been stellar in taking up their assignment under God. And, and so Paul has been, been speaking about that in this prayer. He's been thanking God for how well they've done in fulfilling their role, their assignment as the church. This last section, verses 9 through 11, he actually kind of projects ahead. And he asks God on their behalf that they would never be a church that lets up on those kinds of things. That they would never be a church that becomes static or satisfied or stagnant but that they would always be embracing that mission for which God has called them into existence, and that they would be consistent in productivity of their life that will matter more in eternity than anything else they'll do. So this, of course, is brought on because of their complete, their complete commitment to the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, this model for a missional church continues this morning, and we see in this last section of this prayer that the missional church bears evidence that the gospel has impacted its being, its existence. Has your life been so impacted by the gospel that there is evidence to that effect in your life? And then that's what Paul is, is saying is true of the Philippians, and that's what he's praying will be true of the Philippians on an ongoing basis because he and they have come to recognize that it's the importance of our mission that compels the church to pursue common experiences of life together. I mentioned one of those last week. I talked about an interpersonal cohesiveness that would exist among the people of God where a church is missional in its methods. Two things about that that we find in Paul's prayer. The first one is this, that there is this emotional connection. There's this, this way that we feel about each other, where, where we understand that we are united in purpose, we're united in cause, we're united in Christ. And so there's this oneness that causes us to have this affection. Paul says, I think good thoughts about you and I have a place for you in my heart because we're together in this gospel venture. But then he also talks about the fact that this interpersonal cohesiveness manifests itself in experiential cooperation. They are working together. They're doing this thing called church together. And, and basically what he says is that they have been in defense and confirmation of the gospel, partaking with him. They've been allowing their lives to be used, to be utilized in gospel activity. And so their goal is to advance the gospel. So that's, that's where we got to last week. Now, there's a second part of, of this, this work together that comes out in the last part of this prayer. And, it's, and Paul speaks then as he prays futuristically about the church that, that the impact of the gospel would result in an increasing faith, fruitfulness in their lives, an increasing fruitfulness. Now, I know that every one of us are probably considering ourselves these days to be victims of the great deep freeze of 2021, right? 
Anybody remember that event? Yeah, it was epic, wasn't it? Probably never forget it. I, I, in fact, every time that I walk out into my yard, I remember it. Because everything in my yard had to be replaced. You know why? Because it just froze to death. And so nothing that was in our yard, basically, was being productive. It was not being fr fruitful any longer. So it had to be done away with. Well, Paul, when he speaks about the church, and I believe that he does this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, speaks about it as an entity in which the individual members, those who make up the church, ought to have a measure of fruitfulness, productivity, that issues from their lives. And so, yes, that means you, and that means me. So whenever Paul begins to, to pray futuristically uh, for the church to continue in some things that are happening, he prays for this increased fruitfulness, this fruitfulness, this productivity. And he, he shows a couple of ways that it can be manifested. The first one he says is this. Look in verse 9. This I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. The first thing that he says that, that this increasing fruitfulness will be, will be manifested with is the enlargement of care for one another. He says, I pray that your love may abound more and more. Okay? You know, it's one, of the, one of the writers that writes about marriage talks about a love tank or a love bank or something like that. Well, Paul prays for the church that their love tank or their love bank or, or whatever it is would just be constantly overflowing, that there would never even be a time that it goes below full, that it's constantly overflowing. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, first of all, we need to remember that he's talking about that biblical kind of love that you know as the word agape love, which is a very special kind of love. It, it's a thoroughgoing love. It's a thoroughgoing love that just saturates and, and, and consumes the individual. It, it's a love that lives to give itself away. It, it has little to do with what I feel, little to do with what I even say, but it has so much to do with what I do, with my actions. Now, if we want to figure out the prime example for this, all we have to do is to look to God. This is the kind of love that God has for humanity. Now, let's, let's remember that kind of love a little bit. It's the love of God for sinful humanity. In other words, whenever God looked into my life, and he saw someone who was rotten to the core, and yes, corrupt in my nature. My sinful nature was corrupt and rotten to the core. I know that's very difficult for anybody here to believe, but it's a fact. Whenever God looked into me and saw me as vile and as rotten as I could possibly be, you know what happened? God didn't say, ugh, uh, no, not him. I don't love him. He said, I love you with an everlasting love. And he reached toward me in the person of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he gave his son. Scripture says God so loved, agape, God so loved the world that he gave his son so that my sin through him could be forgiven and, and this vileness and this rottenness could be overcome. And where corruption existed, incorruption now is present. Where vileness was present, now purity exists. And, and so God did this. He extended his love to me. Even in that while I was still a sinner, Christ died for me. So this is the kind of love that Paul's talking about that should, should be in and out of the church. It's this thoroughgoing love. It's a love that is so vast and so incomprehensible that God has bestowed upon us that even whenever we do begin to grasp it just a little bit, we stand back in amazement and say, Behold, what manner of love is this? And, and we, we are astounded that God would pour that kind of love out on us. And so as Paul prays for the church, he asks God to grow that kind of love among the believers. He asks God to enlarge this love. How, how much does he want God to enlarge it? He says, until it abounds. He says, God, he says, God, would you please enlarge this kind of love in the congregation of people that identify with Christ until it abounds? Well, and then, he says, until it abounds, then more. And then abounds still more and more. He says, God, please continue to enlarge this love until it becomes the hallmark of the body of Christ. 
so that whenever a watching world looks in on the church, they are astounded and amazed by how they love each other in spite of whatever deficiencies, whatever failures, whatever flaws, whatever differences we might share or have. He says that when the world looks in at the church, if God's prayer is being answered, the, the world will stand back and say, I don't know much about those people, but boy, I, I'm amazed at how they love. And so he says, I pray that God will cause your love to abound more and more and more, that this love that we possess is to be abounding, is to be flowing, that's the word, moving through the body of Christ like electricity. Do we have that kind of love here? Do you have that kind of love in your heart? Then, he says, if this is love that's truly like God's love, not only will it exist within the body, but it will extend beyond the body. It'll extend to that world out there. You know, those people you don't like. Those people that you don't want to hang out with. Those people that you say, how could anybody love them? This, Paul is praying that the church would learn how to love people that are not that lovely and not that lovable. That we would learn how to be the, the hands and the feet and the heart of God to a world that doesn't know what love even looks like, sounds like. That's what Paul prays for the church. But he, he, says, he says something about this love. He says, I pray that your love may abound still more and then still more. But then he, he says a couple of things about it. He says, in knowledge and all discernment. Now those words are critical and key to us understanding what Paul is praying for here. When he says, I want your love to abound in knowledge, what he's saying is that this can't be just some sort of a, of a love that, that just pours out and doesn't recognize what's going on, the knowledge that he speaks about here is an experiential knowledge. He says it's, it's a knowledge of who the people are and, and what that love would require, what that love would necessitate. If, if you enacted love towards someone, the knowledge of what that love needs to look like in their life is important. And, and so it's the difference between just a love that's, that's conceptual and a love that's, that's actually targeted and practical. For some people, uh, uh, this kind of love might mean that you, you, you go help them undertake some task that they couldn't finish on their own, or you, you do something nice for them because they're hurting. You reach out to them in, in love because something's going on in their life and, and they just need some encouragement. It could take all sorts of shapes and sizes, but it goes beyond just the concept, conceptual of driving down the road and seeing someone say, oh, I love that person. Let me, let, me, let, me give you the, let me give you an example. Most people, whenever they are moving toward a, an, an event in their lives called marriage, they love the idea of getting married, right? But they really don't know what all that's going to look like, right? Because until you really get married, you don't know what that experience of marriage looks like. And so whenever you get married and you begin to know that person, then you begin to know how to love them based on who they are, and you begin to love them accordingly. It's the, it's the same way with the, the church in the church and the church beyond the church. We learn to love based on what that love needs to look like for the person that we're extending it to. So that the, the, the object of that love becomes the center point of it. And so knowledge is important. And, 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 and he tells us that this, this love is best enacted when we know the object well enough to know how to love them. Then it also speaks about discernment. Discernment is a practical kind of wisdom that needs to accompany the execution of this agape love. See, the truth is, if we don't have this sense of, of, of discernment and knowledge, what happens is that we, we have the idea that we're just supposed to love everybody in all situations, regardless of what their conduct, their behavior looks like, and we have to affirm them. In fact, the world has come to the place where it has replaced the idea of this kind of love with knowledge and discernment with the idea of affirmation. That if you love me, you have to affirm everything that I do, everything that I say, and everything that I stand for. And if you don't, then, then you're, you're mean, you're mean-spirited, you're, you're hateful, you're, you're, you're awful. And, and that's not what this love looks like. This love not only has the knowledge of the object, but it also has a discernment, a practical wisdom that doesn't just, just blanket statement and blank check affirm every behavior. It's not a blank check acceptance of everything that's ever said and everything that's done. 
It recognizes and elevates the value of every person, but it doesn't necessarily recognize and elevate the values of every person. And there is a difference. So he says that whenever this knowledge is, this love is present with knowledge and all discernment, then he says, then you are able to approve the things that are excellent. So the, the goal, the standard here, is that we're all trying to get to, to this place in life where the things that come out of our lives are things that are excellent. Things that are excellent according to who? Well, according to God. According to God's Word. God leads us into behavior, to conduct, to character that is excellent. And so he teaches us, and, and, and we, we follow through. And so the goal then is to find those things that are excellent in the lives of each other and to approve or to affirm those. And not to approve just anything and everything if it goes against the ways that God has established in his word. So he says that you have this, this enhancement of, of perspective that gives you knowledge and discernment where you, you don't have a blank check acceptance of everything that happens and you're able to approve those things that are excellent. And he says this leads you to a, to a, a behavior that he calls sincere. You know what sincere is? Let me, let me explain this word to you a little bit. It's actually made up of two words. Uh, the first word is the, word, the, the Greek word S-U-N, which means together. And the second word is the word sire, which is the, the word for light. And so what he says is that whenever you are able to hold your life and light together, and, 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 and what, what, is, what is seen is visible and transparent, what's honest and true, he says that's what sincerity is. Whenever someone's sincere, it means that they're transparent and that what you can see into their lives when the life is held up to the sun or to the light of God's word is something that, that passes inspection. It's able to withstand a detailed look. It's the idea that God inspects our lives. God looks into our lives. And, and when he does, and when we look into the lives of each other, that we can be found, he says, without offense. And, and, so, and so our lives become this this story in measuring ourselves against the word of God, allowing the light of God's word to shine and to, to find the flaws in our lives, the weak spots in our lives, and then under God we move forward to work out those weak spots in our lives. And that's what God wants to do in us by the presence and power and work of his Holy Spirit. So we have this, this opportunity for discernment that allows us to understand what is the appropriate path for the believer to walk? What is the appropriate conduct and behavior? And, and, and we love each other in, in, that, in that yielding up of appropriate living and, and, and appropriate conduct. We, we lift each other up in that, and we approve that, and we affirm that, and we continue to let that love just grow and grow in our midst. So the last thing he talks about in this prayer is now an, an expansion of productivity that grows out of this atmosphere, this environment. Look at what he says in verse 11. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness. This, this expansion of productivity, he says, has to do with being filled with the fruits of righteousness. Now, let's talk about the fruits of righteousness. And, and we're not talking about the fruit of the Spirit per se here, but the fruit of the Spirit certainly would come into play here. But when he talks about righteousness, there's a couple of things about that. The first thing that righteousness means in biblical terminology is right standing before God. That, that we know that our lives are right with God. That we've come to the place in our lives where we have trusted Jesus as our Savior and entrusted our lives to Him and, and, and chosen and committed to follow him and to, to trust him and to live before him with our lives. We, we've given our, our, our lives and our hearts to Jesus. And that, that makes us right in the sight of God. And Scripture talks about the fact that whenever we come to God in faith, that there's a righteousness that is, that is apportioned out to us by God. He gives us the righteousness of Christ. And so it's a right standing before God. But that word righteousness is also used to talk about the conduct of those who've obtained right standing with God. It's a righteous way of living. And so he says that what, what 
whenever, whenever this prayer is being prayed, Paul says, I'm praying that as the love of Christ abounds more and more and fills you up and gives you knowledge and discernment so that you can approve things that are excellent, that ultimately that will give way to your life being filled, to being overflowing with all of the fruits of the righteousness of God and the righteousness of Christian character that he wants to, to pour out of your life. How do we get this? How does this become something that becomes real for us? This is what he says. He says, these things come to us by Jesus Christ. As we pursue this relationship with Jesus, as we tell Jesus regularly, I love you, Jesus. I, I, I want to follow you, Jesus. I want to live before you, Jesus. I want to know you, Jesus, as much as I can. And Paul will come back in this very epistle to say that knowing Christ is the, the highest ambition of his life to know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. And so he says this comes to us by Jesus or, or through Jesus. Jesus grants this to us. Jesus apportions this to us as we walk more closely with him. And so Paul is, is praying that the Ephesian believers would just get closer and closer and closer to Jesus all the time so that their lives would pour out more and more righteous character, more and more righteous behavior. And he says, whenever this happens, then our lives become a story that is all about glory and praise to God. That, that our lives become a testimony to the goodness of God and the, the amazing things that God can accomplish in a life whenever it's totally sold out and dedicated to Him. And that's where God is trying to take us each by His Holy Spirit. Into that depth of surrender so that all of our life is consumed by the person of Christ, so that pouring out of our life is all of this godly character, so that the world can look in and, and so that we can point to God and say glory and praise to Him. It's all about Him. It's not about me. So this is, this is what Paul is praying. This is Paul's prayer, is that the church would be filled full of all of these things because he understands that this is God's goal for his church. God's goal for his church is that love would abound more and more and that all these other things would follow that. Now, I want to wrap this up, and this is kind of a closing for last week and this week. It, it's, it's, it's four things that I want us to understand that are what I would call keys to becoming a truly missional church. And I've given you a lot of things about that over the last few weeks, but this is just kind of the wrap-up of all of that. And so I want to give you four things that I think are very important. If we, if we would aspire to really be a church that's on mission with God and to be individuals who in our own hearts and on our own part take up our part of that mission to be missional people in a missional church, then there are four things that I want to give you. The first one is this. We must understand what it means to be a missional church. We need to take this to heart and we need to understand that God has called us into existence to share a mission with Him, to undertake a mission for Him, to bring glory and honor to Him, to live our lives on mission with God. And I, I gave you five characteristics of that last week. If you missed them, go back and listen. Find them again. And there, there are more, but those are five key characteristics to what it means to be a missional church. We must understand what a missional church is. Secondly, we've got to decide that's what we want to be. It, it, it's, it's easy to talk the talk. But it's difficult to walk the walk. For, for a church to be a missional church, it, it has so much more to do than just what we do in here on a Sunday morning. It has to do with what you do on a Monday morning and a Tuesday morning and every other day of the week. It has to do with how you move through your life and, and how you interact with Jesus, how you interact on behalf of Jesus with the world around you. So we have to decide that this is what we want to do. We, we can be a church that just gathers and, and hangs out, enjoys each other's company. Or we can be a church that sees ourselves as someone that God has commissioned. And we have a duty, a responsibility, an honor, and a privilege to serve Him. So we might, we've got to decide that's what we want to be. Third, we must realize that there is a vast difference between learning and launching. We can learn this all we want to. We can learn all the truth and all the facts about what God wants us to do in our lives and in His church. We can learn, 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 learn. But there's a difference between learning and launching. 
At some point, you have to push away from the dock. At some point, you have to shove off from the bank. You have to get out in the water. At some point, we've just got to say, you know what? We know enough now to do something. We've, we've got enough knowledge to do something. I've got enough knowledge to tell someone somewhere that Jesus loves them. I've got enough knowledge in, in my head and in my heart to tell someone that Jesus died for their sin. I've got enough knowledge to tell someone that if they place their faith in Jesus, that Jesus will save them and forgive them. And he'll give them a place in his eternity forever. I've got that much knowledge. So sometimes, at some point, we've got to say, okay, I've learned enough to do something. And we have to launch. We have to step apart from the comfort zone that we find ourselves so attached to and connected with and just do it. Fourth thing, if we're going to be a truly missional church, we must begin now. If the words of Jesus are true, and I believe with all of my heart that 100% of everything he ever said is true, then when he spoke to his disciples in John chapter 4 at, at the end of that encounter with the Samaritan woman, and he was talking to his disciples and he said these words, you say there are yet four months into the harvest, but I say to you, look now unto the fields because they are white already unto harvest. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers, there are just far too few. That's what Jesus said 2,000 years ago. Well, I want to tell you something. There, there are a lot more people in this world today that do not know Jesus than there were in the world of Jesus' day. The, the population of this world has just exploded. Billions of people and billions of those do not know Jesus. And some of them live right here in this town. Some of them live right on your street. Some of them live in the places that you work and frequent and eat and shop. And they just don't know Jesus. And, and nothing about the Scripture is going to change. Those who die in their sin without knowing Jesus will be separated from God forever in eternity. And so we've got to begin. We've got to launch. And, and, and to do that, I mean, you know, I, I'm... I'm a person who, who, who is reluctant to even do anything like schedule a, a visitation time or outreach time because what's happened in, in church life in the past is that whenever that was over, when it was Monday night from 6 to 8 and outreach ended, people checked that box and put that back in their pocket until the next Monday night. Folks, we don't need to have a, a, a six to eight Monday night outreach. We need to have our feet on the pavement every day and, and view ourselves as on mission with God every step that we take. And our outreach needs to be 100% all the time. Our love for the world needs to abound more and more and more until we have a heart for people like God does. That's what Paul's praying for the church. That's what God's goal for his church is. Do we care? enough to reach out well that's that's paul's prayer for a church to continue on mission now i want to kind of drive that home a little bit personally for us the first thing that paul recognized about that church is it was made up of a group of people who had committed their lives to the lordship of jesus and so as we conclude this morning i think that's the place we begin is where i have to ask myself and you yourself have I ever come to the place where I've really placed my faith in Christ as my Savior? Have I committed my life to the Lordship of Jesus? And, and if you're here this morning and you can't say yes to that, I, I, want to, I want to invite you to Christ today. I want to invite you to come to Jesus, to just come with your life and say, Lord, I, I may not know all that this means, but I know that I need a Savior. I know that I've sinned against God, and I know that I need to be right in His sight, so I'm coming today to trust you. I want Jesus in my heart. If you're here today and that needs to happen, I want you to know we'd be glad to help you with that. We'd be glad to guide you as best we can through the, the process and, and, and the way of understanding how to receive Christ as your Savior. And, and you, can, you can do that. You can do that here today. If, if in a moment, whenever we have our, our time of just contemplation and quietness, considering what God is saying, we'll have people down front. If you want to come to one of us and just say, you know, I want to trust Jesus today, we would love to help you with that. Or maybe, maybe you're not quite 
ready to take that step, but you'd like to visit about it beyond this service, we'd be happy to talk to you anytime, anywhere about your fellowship of Jesus and your commitment to him in your life. But just let us know. You alone know what God's saying to your heart. Maybe you're here as a believer and you're saying, you know what, I've learned a long time, but today I'm ready to launch. Maybe you just need to bow your heart before God and say, God, with your help and the power of your spirit, somehow, some way, this week, I'm gonna be on mission with you, whatever that means, and you show me, Lord, you show me, and I'll do whatever you need me to do. Maybe you're here and God's leading you to unite with this church family. We would love for you to make that known to us today as well. We will have people down front to receive you if, you, if that's a, a commitment, a decision that you need to make. Whatever God's speaking to you about this morning, we want this time in front of us to be an opportunity for you just to respond overtly if you choose to and need to, to, to put feet to your heart's desire and your commitment to God. So I'm going to ask us all to, to just stand together, and I want to lead us in prayer. And then we're going to hear some music for a little bit. And if, if you need to come this morning, you just slip out from where you are, and we will be here to greet you. So, Father, we come now in Jesus' name. And we ask that you would make your message ring in our hearts, cause us to, to hear what you want us to hear from you. And if there's any commitment that any of us need to make today, oh, Lord God, please, please help us just to to follow through right here, right now, for the glory of God in Jesus' name. With our heads bowed, we'll just listen to hear what God will say to us.